All right, well, welcome everyone. Thanks for so much for coming to my talk. I know there's great competition between sessions and lots of really great stuff to go to. I'm upset that I can't go to the other ones. Um, so uh, my name is Benjamin Mako Hill, and I am, in addition to being thrilled to be, be here, uh, I am, uh, I don't know, uh, I love coming to Libre Planet, uh, and I haven't actually give, had the opportunity to give a talk here in a couple years, but it's one of my favorite audiences of sort of like-minded, very sort of principled people. Uh, I um, am, my background is, you know, I, I, I have worked in free software communities since I was 12 years old. I'm now 32 years old, so uh, it's been uh, a large majority of my life. Um, I've worked sort of primarily in the Debian project, where I've been a hacker and contributor for a long time, and also within the Ubuntu project, which I was one of the people who helped create it, uh, part of the founding team. I'm currently a member of the, I'm also a member of the Free Software Foundation's Board of Directors. And uh, I think perhaps most relevant to what I'm gonna be talking to you today, uh, talking to you about today, is that I, my day job is sort of uh, studying free software and free culture communities more broadly. I'm a social scientist uh, at MIT. I guess we'll, I'll be starting in September at the University of Washington. Uh, as a professor of communication, and I study free software communities and what, and free culture communities, and, and I'm interested in what makes them work or not work. So I want to, today, what I want to do, I, I've had a little bit of a provocative title. I want to say, when free software isn't better in the program, it says practically better, which sort of gives away part of my, uh, part of my, my answer. But my question that I really want to talk today about is how is something that, which I think about a lot, both in my capacity as a, sort of a, director of the Free Software Foundation, but also in terms of my, uh, in, in terms of a lot of my work in these communities, which is about how do we, how should we go about advocating for free and for, 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 for free software? And uh, what I want to talk to you today is about the way that I've seen a lot of advoca advocacy within our community, which is what I call sort of work that, that takes on what I think of as the promise of open source, and that's in quotes for a particular reason. Uh, I, I want to sort of begin by introducing this major debate between free software on the one hand and open source, which is a now 15-year-old debate, which most of you are probably very familiar with and perhaps not, even, not particularly interested in me re-raising at this point. But what I want to do is frame the first big chunk of my uh, talk around what I call the promise of open source, um, which is more or less, I want to suggest, the template that most of us, uh, even free software advocates, have used in our advocacy. I then want to try, to try to systematically show that the promise, this promise, is only very rarely realized. Um, and then subsequently, what I hope is the, I mean, that's supposed to be the depressing part of the talk. And then subsequently, in what I hope is the more inspiring part of the talk, uh, I want to argue that, free so that, that a free software approach, thinking about principles, um, and thinking uh, as they relate to the same pieces of software, provide a different way of talking about software under free license that can help us speak to a series of inherent practical benefits, which I'm going to highlight. Now, uh, I, need, I, I need to begin uh, with the free software definition as a way of, because uh, I'm at Libre Planet, and, uh, um, but, but, but I'm sure that this is all very familiar to, uh, to many of you. This, uh, uh, this set of four principles of the core of free software, the freedom to run software for any purpose, the freedom to study how it works, the freedom to distribute copies so you can help your neighbor, and then of course the freedom to improve the program and release those to the public. But what I want to suggest here is that this definition, and the important part right here, I'm going to come back and talk about these principles later, but what I want to suggest right away is that the, is, is that, is the, what I want to highlight here is the fact that this is based on principles. Um, now, on the other hand, we have the open. So we have this is this is the mission statement of the open source initiative, and it and and it and it provides what I think is the template for the way in which even those of us that believe in these principles, um, it's the way that we that we advocate for it uh, more often. And this is so the open source mission statement. So you go to opensource.org. It says it's right on the top of the page. It says that open source is a development method for for software that harnesses the power of distributed peer review and transparency of process. The promise of open source is better quality, higher reliability, more flexibility, lower cost, and an end to predatory vendor lock-in. Now, there are two things that I want to point out here. Um, uh, and this is something that I, so I, I uh, when I teach this material, I, I put this up here as well. The, the first is, is a statement about inherent quality of a, of a, you know, in this term, open source, but of a free software development methodology. 
Um, and this seems true. When we think about free software, we think about projects that are very successful, that, that are very high quality, that are very flexible, that don't cost very much, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we think of things like Apache, right? You know, people are familiar with Apache used all over the place. We think about the Linux kernel, which of course seems to be pretty high quality, seems to be pretty flexible, seems to uh, not cost very much and seems to avoid predatory vendor um, lock-in. We see things that are high quality, reliable, et cetera. But the, sec but, but the second, and, and so that's, that's the first thing I want to point out. The second thing I want to point out is a mechanism, which is the reason that open source in these terms is better, or free software really, because we're talking about the same thing, um, is better, is because of this idea of distributed peer review and transparency of process. The mechanism, uh, the mechanism he here is, is, uh, is, made is made explicit. Um, this idea that, that by putting the stuff online, we'll make it available, and, and that as a result, people will come in and be able to make it better. And, um, and it was made clear by, by Eric Raymond, the person who, of course, coined the, the, the term open source as in opposition to free software, and we'll come back to that later. Um, but but you know, he, he, described, he, he described this as what we call sort of Linus's law. And the idea here was is that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Or more formally, given a large enough beta tester and co-developer base, almost every problem will be characterized quickly, and the fix will be obvious to someone. And I put this up as sort of the, the model behind the sort of open source uh, approach, right? The idea here is that we put our stuff online, publish openly, a community will come in and improve it, we'll end up with stuff that's really high quality, and voila, at the end, somehow we profit a lot. Now. Um, this concept of superiority comes from, comes from 1998, wh where, uh, which I s probably some of you are too young to remember. Who uh, does not remember uh, 1998 very well? A few, a few people. It's like, oh my gosh. Uh, um, so 1998, for those of you who don't remember, was the period of the dot-com boom. And, uh, the, and, and open source as a term was absolutely part of that. O open source was, uh, as many people here are very familiar, coined by a bunch of people f from, in many cases, the free software community as a way of distancing f the, the products of free software from its principles. Um, so from those four essential freedoms, we, 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 uh, a number of people wanted to, to separate you know, all the high quality stuff that was being produced, like Apache and like Linux, because the idea was, and you know, Eric Raymond would say this, as soon as you say the word freedom to someone in a suit, they turn around and run the other direction. Um, that, was, that was his basic argument. And, and, and back in 1998, a lot of people who wore suits all of a sudden took a lot of interest in free software, now rebranded, at least within some groups, um, as open source. And it, and, and it was enormous. And, and profit certainly happened, at least in the short term. Um, Red Hat, of course, was founded during this period. VA Linux Systems, which a number of people, I see at least one person here who definitely worked there. Uh, uh, but, um, uh, which was, and VA was the single most successful initial public offering in history. Um, still is. It was the most successful, um, uh, and uh, uh, VA Linux Systems. Um, uh, and I've heard this model here described by some people as the paleo Raymondist model. Um, so, 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 so Raymond, in this case, is a reference to Eric Raymond, the person who really is responsible for this form of advocacy and who is very, much, very involved in, in uh, promoting open source as a way of distancing the products of free software from its principles. Um, um, but so it's, uh, uh, and it's paleo because it's old, way back to 1998, which a quarter of the audience is too young to remember. Um, um, but it's also paleo because it's out of date. Time has taught us a lot about this way of viewing things. And so people in this room will be very familiar with critiques of, uh, critiques of, of open source. Uh, um, basically, people arguing that we shouldn't talk about open source because, because it uh, distances itself from, the, um, from our principles. And that is enormously important. Um, um, but it's also important, I, I want to argue, uh, uh, th that we distance ourselves from this sort of argument because it's very often wrong. It doesn't work this way. Um, the reality, and it's a harsh reality, is that there's been a lot of evidence that things are not as rosy as we, and maybe Eric Raymond in particular, would like, to, would like it to be. Um, uh, th this model, this old model back here, has been interpreted, and perhaps, and perhaps misinterpreted, um, uh, as saying that if you take your software and put it on the web, that people will come in, they will start fixing all the bugs in it, and uh, you will be able to sit back and profit. Now, 
talking to a room full of people who have done free software, at least some subset of whom have done free software, you'll see the disconnect between, you might have an idea of the disconnect between that model and the reality of, of working on this stuff. Now, here's the bad news. It's not that, it's not that easy, um, something which many of you already know. All that stuff up there uh, before about how great free software is, it's not always true. In fact, I want to argue it's not often true. Um, uh, um, so here's, uh, here, here's how I see it. I, uh, uh, free software is often less featureful than proprietary software. It is often lower quality. Uh, it is very often worse or at the very least not better for business. Um, and it is very often uncollaboratively uh, collaborative in its development. Now, that's all bad news. I'm going to walk through that in depth to sort of help it sink in. But I want to, but what, I, what, what I'm going to argue fundamentally here is that this isn't a bad problem because there are other inherent benefits that we can, that we can talk about in our advocacy and they're directly connected to the benefits um, and to the principles at, um, at, the, at the base of free software. Uh, so first, uh, in the early days of any free software project, before the features have been written, free software is uh, not, free software is not always uh, less features uh, full, or not always more featureful than the extant proprietary software. When you start a project, it of course doesn't have many features because you're just starting it. And in, uh, and in the later days, when the projects are mature, free software is very often still less featureful. Now, uh, this is a great, uh, up on the screen is a cover of an excellent book on writing Linux device drivers, and I wish I didn't have to know that, uh, in a sense. So back when I was 14 or 15 years old, I once uh, wanted to buy a CD, I wanted to buy a CD-ROM drive. Back then when you had to buy CD-ROM drives. And so I went to a list of CD-ROM drives which were supported in Linux, uh, the Linux kernel. And I, uh, and I picked one off the list and I went out and got it. But it turns out that the, the drive that I got was the next revision and it wasn't supported in the driver and I basically ended up trying to have to uh, write or modify a driver to work with it. Sometimes we need to go buy great books like this and write our own device drivers. Now, uh, um, obviously, uh, uh, that's, not, uh, that's, that, that's rarely the case when people use the most popular proprietary operating systems. Um, now, Today, most people who pick up a new CD-ROM drive, if they even have a CD-ROM drive in their computer, don't worry too much about support for CD-ROM drivers or, honestly, other drivers either. The Linux kernel is just a much more mature project uh, today, and many of these drivers have been written for the software. But that's not always the case. Other times, feature development doesn't happen, not because people just haven't got around to it, as was the case, say, you know, 15 years ago in the free software world. Um, um, but because feature development can actually be hard. Sometimes features are just really hard to develop. Sometimes they require specialized knowledge in order to build them. And sometimes the, the, the features that people want, uh, um, sometimes the people who want features don't have the skills or the time to build the technology. So uh, video, uh, this, this is just, uh, there have been free software video editing tools under active development for more than a decade. Tons of people edit video. Um, people edit video on non-free operating systems. Tons of people edit video on free software operating systems. But despite all of the uh, interest in this topic and despite all of the work, free software still lags heavily in terms of basic features. This is a picture of Final Cut Pro, which is a proprietary piece of software written by Apple. It's very large, it's very complicated, it has an enormous number of features, um, and those features, and there are thousands of features in a piece of software like this, matter a lot to Final Cut's users. Um, but honestly, I I'd love something that was as featureful and stable as iMovie, which is the sort of crappy alternative video editor that Apple also writes and gives away for free on its computers. This is Cinelera. I don't know if people have used Cine, Cinelera. Um, I have. Uh, um, I've used it and I like it quite a lot, actually. It installs easily today on distributions other than Fedora, which is an important step forward. Uh, I also use PTV, which I used last week to edit some video, which I also like quite a lot. But I think that even the most sort of ardent advocate of free software, and I think that I'm pretty close to one of the more advocate uh, uh, ardent advocates of free software and free software video tools will we'll admit that to this day there's no, we're nowhere near feature parity in terms of uh, in terms of the top pieces of proprietary software um, we're not even close and not through a lack of trying people are continuing to work on it and the gap is closing over time but we're just not there yet I do like this uh, this is the old uh, list of icons for uh, for Cinelera I like the unsharp there's like a little picture up there um, 
in any case, uh, oh, uh, huh, okay. Um, so questions of quality are sometimes uh, questions of quality are sometimes related to, um, to, to to features because although it may it may be that Cinelera doesn't Cinelera doesn't do everything that Final Cut does at the moment it may, it, it may do the things that it does do extremely well. There are lots of pieces of free of free software um, that just do that, that don't just do very little. What they do, they do kind of poorly. Um, does anyone uh, uh, so so who here uh, knows about OpenMoco? A few people who here had one. I did. Uh, who here knows what's going on in this side of this picture over here? Any? A couple of people. Uh, um, and did you do it yourself? Uh, so 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 uh, uh, this is. Uh, Anyway, this is a this is a buzz fixing party, and I'll describe what that is in a minute. I had I I, I did this on my phone. So, OpenMoco was a phone pictured right that aimed to be the world's first free hackable phone. But although the OpenMoco was, and I think still is, someone correct me if that's not wrong, the world's freest phone. It wasn't quite as free as we might like, but it was quite good. It was not the world's highest quality phone measured along many other dimensions. I think it's fair to say. Uh, so one of the things that people like to do with their phones is they like to call people, and OpenMoco did that. Uh, uh, um, uh, another thing that people like to do with their phones is they like, they like it when the people on the other side of the phone can reliably hear them and not be drowned out by loud buzzing noises, and OpenMoco was uh, less good at that part for the most part. <laughs> There was a problem with the phone that involved an interaction with cell phone towers of particular frequencies that made the other side of phone conversations, that is not the person talking, very, very hard to hear, um, uh, at least for many, many users. And the photos on the right up here, is that your right? Yeah, the, your, the, um, are people fixing their phones by resoldering a capacitor. And this was actually a party in Germany, of a, I think it was in Germany, of a buzz fix party where there, when there were a series of these parties which were organized around the world so the people who bought this phone could bring their phones in and, uh, fix, it, um, and fix it so that it sounded pretty good. Now, uh, the point here is, is that sometimes the free stuff doesn't work as well, at least not out of the box. Um, uh, network Manager. I think it's safe to pick on Network Manager today because it's actually quite good and high quality. I've been very happy with Network Manager in the last uh, three years or so. But this, as this picture might suggest, was not always the case. Um, uh, I, I just want to, for people that have been using free software for a long time, it's, it's sort of, uh, uh, it's worth reflecting on your experience a little bit, right? Using GNU Linux, trying to connect to networks and, and failing to do so. How many hours of my life have I spent in that limbo state of not being connected, but trying to be connected, right? Like, how did that feel, if that sounds familiar to you, right? How does that feel like looking at your friend with a Mac sort of like happily surfing away, right? Like, I know how that feels on some level. And I'm willing to do it, and I don't feel bitter or upset about it, but it's worth reflecting on the fact that sometimes things aren't as easy. Sometimes things don't work as well. Now, uh, I'm not suggesting that proprietary software has no bugs or that, or, or, that, uh, uh, or that proprietary phones are always better, although maybe most proprietary phones do work better than OpenMoco did, at least initially. Proprietary software very often sucks and is horrible, and if you use proprietary software, I could have talk after talk of many, many other examples of uh, horrible bugs and missing features in proprietary software uh, as well. The point here is, is, is not that proprietary software doesn't suck, it's that our software also sucks. Um, the stuff in the free world, at least sometimes. And what I'm suggesting is that we should stop making it, uh, and what I'm fundamentally suggesting that we should stop making uh, it a pillar of our advocacy that our software sucks less, less because that's not always true. The third point wanna, that I want to make is that uh, uh, I mentioned earlier that free software, that, that uh, the idea of sort of open source was um, designed as a way of selling free software to a business community as a sort of panacea and a method towards profit, uh, easy profits. And that was the basic model, right? Um, uh, software gets better, so you can charge more. The development costs go down because you have all these random people on the internet fixing your bugs. Um, you get to make loads of money, and your stock goes up, and uh, life gets good. That was the basic argument. Now, these arguments were first made, as I've suggested, around 1998 to 1999, and going into the, um, really into the height of the dot-com bubble. And I think it's worth noting that free software, uh, um, uh, that, that free software and many open source people were on a lot of the advisory boards of these companies that were, um, uh, or major investors in many cases as well. But only a small number of the companies that, that have been founded on 
uh, sort of free software principles or free software like as products um, uh, have even been successful enough to become public companies. So we actually have very little data to talk about how, um, talk about, to evaluate how well free software um, companies have done. Uh, the companies that we do have are VA Linux Systems, Red Hat, which bought Cygnus, um, uh, uh, Andover, Cobalt, and Caldera. And although data on these companies, like we can look at how these companies have done, and I'm about to show you that, um, it's far from a strong evaluation of the sort of wisdom uh, of a free software business model. It does suggest that uh, firms that, that firms that have used free software as a central part of their business have done less than fantastic. Uh, this is a this is the sort of this is the the y-axis here is market capitalization, um, and the the. Um, and then you see time along this axis, and each of these lines here represents one of uh, those those free software, publicly traded free software companies over the period of time in which it was uh, in, over which it was traded. And you can see here that uh, 1998 uh, to 2000, we see the dot com boom and this big spike in 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 use, and then uh, that huge that's expite, this ex a lot of excitement around the dot com boom and around the idea of free software as a methodology. Um, the red line here is. Is Red Hat, um, the only company, I think it's fair to say, that has really made it, and they're really doing really, really well. Um, the light blue line is VA Linux. You can see they spike very uh, high, and then they sort of um, become, uh, uh, have the single most successful IPO in history. And then, as I've suggested, uh, they sort of, they're, they're today really a shadow of their former self. But this, of course, was the dot-com boom and bust, right? Lots of proprietary companies also did very poorly. So we, but and what we can do is we can actually compare the market capitalization over this period between this group to all of the other uh, companies, uh, the companies that had their IPO in the same in the same window, right? And what we see there is uh, two rather similar looking lines. You can see that on average, free software companies did um, or have done about as well as the proprietary competitors. Three out of four of them are now in business, which is actually a little better, uh, uh, or are now out of business, which is actually a little bit better than the dot-com boom did in general. Um, most are acquired by other companies, um, and a few failed hard. Um, not actually that much worse, but not actually all that much better. Now this is, this, this of course is highly dependent on Red Hat. If Red, um, Red Hat has had some of the strongest growth of any technology company over the last few years, and they're really an exceptional company. If we don't include them, then we see like, something that looks like, uh, like total market capitalization, and then we see like a flat line um, for the free software companies. Um, but here's the more striking thing. Um, if we overlay those graphs on top of each other, um, we see that despite um, Red Hat's success, free software remains a tiny portion of the market. Um, and while the rest of the market has grown, and while there are, pro and there are more publicly traded technology companies today than there were, I don't know, last month or last year, uh, um, there are less free software companies today than there were than there were 10 years ago, certainly. And my point here is, is that free software, um, uh, my, my point here is, is, is not to say, like, let's just give it up. It's to say that free software may, may or may not be great for business. Um, probably it's only about as bad for business as being proprietary. There's not a hit for being free software, at least not from the very basic evidence up here. But it doesn't seem to be much better. If nothing else, it's not being emulated. Most new businesses today are proprietary, and that tide does not seem to be shifting in any sort of measurable way, at least not in the last few years. So I think it's hard to square some of, the, some of what I've just shown with sort of Linus's law as I threw it out there with some of this hype, this real, real really this, this, oh, this, this hype about open source. How can, how, can, how can the software be so bad when anyone can come in and just fix those bugs? They can just implement those features. And the answer is, is that it, it, the, the, reason that, the reason that we don't, we don't make it farther down that model, that paleo Raymondus model, is because, um, it, it is because the collaboration is very often not happening. So we go back to this model here, and we can see that right here, here, this, this aspect of attracting community seems to be a big problem. By celebrating all of those successful projects out there, and by you know, all of the projects that um, probably most of us use and that we're familiar with, and that in many cases we've contributed to, we miss, uh, uh, we miss a very important fact, that for every project that successfully attracts contributors, a whole bunch of projects fail to do so. And the odds, the, the odds of attracting a community are not so great. So maybe people... Um, uh, uh, I mean, so who here has released a, released a free software project? Some, uh, many people in the room. Um, uh, 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 what do you think, based on your experience, the median number of contributors are to a project, uh, to a free software project? 
I can say that I, I say this to when I when I ask this to like my classes of MBAs, I get ten, a hundred, right? Like uh, uh, a couple people, right? Yeah. Right. The median is one. A single developer. And this is using data from SourceForge, which uh, is the largest collection of projects still, believe it or not. Um, uh, but this is, um, uh, um, but the median number of contributors one. And you see this huge power law distribution here as well. But that's all project, right? This includes just like I random SourceForge projects, ideas for projects, including lots of projects with no code at all. So it's not a surprise, maybe. It's hard to expect people to come and contribute to just an idea. So what if we limit it to mature or very mature projects in SourceForge? What do we think the median number of contributors are then? Two, one. Uh, um, uh, you can see the scale moves here, but the distribution is exactly the same, right? Um, uh, uh, the median number of contributors to a mature or very mature project is one. Now, what about if we just look at popular projects? We can just look at the 10% most downloaded projects, um, projects that have been downloaded hundreds of times. The median number of contributors. Two, uh, two people. Um, but SourceForge is old, and, is old and who uses it anyway, right? What if we look on Google Code? What is the median number of contributors to a project on Google Code? One, um, uh, uh, um, but again, um, th this this may be just something. This these sort of throw something up on a website, forget about them type of projects. Maybe we can do better. And Google has this uh, nice way of categorizing projects as inactive, active, or very active. Um, and uh, so in this slide right here, I'm including all Google Code projects, and that's probably unfair. If we limit it just to the ones that are very active, um, uh, and Google's a little bit cagey about what that means, but it means some combination of being worked on and active downloading. So there's an active community of people contributing to you know, wiki edits, contributions, uploads, and there's a download community. The median number of contributors for a project that is active on Google Code, one. A single developer, right? Um, uh, we can look in SourceForge, right? So SourceForge, has, not sorry, we can look in we can look in GitHub because lots of people are using GitHub today. Um, there, it's a little it's a little harder in GitHub to think about what it means to be sort of a member of a community because people don't join projects in GitHub in the same way. Um, the two that I've come up with are looking at either um, the number of forks or the number of watchers. Um, the answer is the same uh, either way we look at it. Um, uh, uh, the, the number of people who are watching a project on GitHub or the number of forks, the median number is one. Um, I could keep going like this for a long time. You see this power law distribution. I downloaded one when I was preparing this talk, like every data set I could find about free software projects. And you see this, this same shape over and over and over. It's like, I don't really believe in social laws, but like if we're going to find one, this distribution is close to it, this sort of power law distribution. I got them for Launchpad, I have them for Savannah, and I have yet to find a specification that changes the shape significantly or that pushes the average number of contributors to a project before um, over two or three. Um, even if we look at projects that have been downloaded thousands of times, have released three times in the last six months, we see the median number of contributors to a project is two. Uh, um, most free software projects are simply not very collaborative. Um, um, and even if we believe in the past, so, and, and this is very important for this, for, 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 for this whole line of like sort of advocacy that I've been talking about so far, because even if we believe in the power of distributed peer review, most people and most examples of free software projects will never reap the benefits because for most projects that distributed peer review never happens because, because it never becomes distributed beyond more than two or three people, at least for most attempts at projects. And I think that that's bad. Um, I think it's bad for three sort of concrete reasons. It's bad because I don't want it to be true. Um, uh, and I can come up with, I, I spent a lot of time coming up with answers for why it might not be. Turns out it's very resistant. Um, uh, it's, it's bad because I use free software all the time and it means that I use software that's not benefiting from this process of having a community. Um, and it's also bad because I like to release my software and have other people fix the bugs and that seems to rarely happen. Um, um, but it's also bad because it means that as, as advocates, and although I have done and continue to do development, um, I, think my, I think of my role primarily as, an, as a sort of an advocate for free software. Um, I think that we have been dishonest in terms of the way that we've gone around and talked about um, free software and why people should use it. We're um, what we are encouraging is essentially false advertising. We're making claims for our product, that is the free software that we're trying to get people to use, um, uh, that, that we can't back up or that at the very least is not always true. 
And it's also bad because it means that we're not focused on making our stuff better in an important way. We're too busy talking about how our development methodology is inherently superior to actually go out and make software that is better um, than or inherently, in, not inherently inferior to the pro proprietary competitors, um, which are in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases sort of kicking our butts. But, um, uh, now I wrote an essay that I, I wrote an essay which I um, which was published in the Free Software uh, Foundation's newsletter um, called "When Free Software Isn't Better," which uh, made some version of this argument. And I uh, was attacked by a number of people who accused me of being paid off by Microsoft or spreading FUD. And that's not what I'm here to do because I sort of um, uh, um, uh, because I, I sort of ended there. I just said, "Hey, people! Like sometimes our stuff isn't better. We should care about freedom." Um, and and uh, uh, but I want to suggest that there is good news. And the good news is. is that that the talk, my talk isn't over. Well, maybe that's good news. Maybe it's bad news for you. Um, uh, the good news is that the title of my talk is not free software isn't better. Um, the, the title of my talk is when free software isn't better. Um, because because I, I do think that free software is better uh, um, along several dimensions, inherently better, not just inherently better in the way, in, just not inherently better in the ways that what I call these sort of open source mode of advocacy is emphasized um, and that we focused on so, so far. I want to suggest that by focusing on freedom, we can offer a more honest and in the long term, a more effective path towards free software advocacy and, organism, uh, and organizing. Um, first, we can focus on a set of inherent, like actually inherent benefits of freedom. Um, and second, um, if we believe that practical issues do matter, and I do believe that practical uh, uh, issues matter a lot, I think that, uh, uh, that and I think they matter to many other people as well. Um, we can start talking about how we can make free software better. And there's lots of different places that we can start. In the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about six ways in which we can make um, six inherent benefits of free software that we can focus on in our advocacy and that are directly connected to the principles behind free software and not the practical benefits behind sort of the, 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 the way of advocating for open source. I'm going to suggest that uh, free software is resistant to anti-features that it makes, um, first, one, that it, two, makes failure cheap, that it, three, makes success cheap, uh, um, four, that it resists sort of central control, um, fifth, that it can sometimes uh, lead to massive collaboration, and then sixth, and most fundamentally, because it gives users freedom. So the first thing I want to talk about is the way that free software uh, resists anti-features. And it's OK if you're sitting here thinking to yourself, what are anti-features? Um, uh, because I made the term up, uh, so uh, uh, only I need to know it. Uh, an anti-feature, as I define it, is a feature that is designed so that a u is a feature designed by the manufacturer of a piece of technology, so so that it, the users of the technology will hate it. Um, uh, kind of like the opposite of a feature in that sense, where the features are things that are designed to make the software do something for you uh, um, that you want. An anti-feature is something which is designed to make, yourself, make your, your technology do something that you don't want it to do. Anti-features are features so bad that users hate so much, they will pay, if they're lucky to be able to, to have those features removed. So like a feature, an anti-feature must be built. It's something that requires effort. It's not a bug. It's not a missing feature. It's, it's, uh, it's added functionality, but it's negative functionality in the sense that it makes, so it makes your technology do something that you don't want it to do. Um, I have a couple concrete examples of this. Um, so I don't know if anyone remembers window, the, 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 this old story about Windows NT Workstation 4.0. Um, but uh, Windows NT, uh, this is one of my favorite examples of an NT feature. Uh, Windows NT, so when Microsoft released Microsoft Windows, I guess, 4.0, they released, they released two versions of NT, one for a workstation and one for a server. And when, while Windows NT server included a bunch of server applications that were not bundled with Windows NT workstation, Microsoft maintained that the products were, um, that these two products, workstation and server, were extremely, to quote, very different products intended for two very different functions. The server version, Microsoft claimed, was suited and tailored for use as an internal server, while the workstation was grossly inadequate. Um, and aiming to uh, sort of reflect, or rather enforce this difference, uh, uh, the Microsoft, uh, the, the NT workstation uh, software was restricted to using only 10 uh, TCP IP connections at a given time. 
Um, so 10 internet connections, while the server version was unlimited. Now, um, some people realized that other than this difference and a few pieces of sort of packaged software, that the, that the products were actually extremely similar. That they were actually so similar that you could just like do hashes of the files and found out that they were exactly identical. The only difference, it turned out, between the server version and the workstation version was a single bit in the, in the registry, which was set by the installer, which would tell the, the, the software that uh, it would tell Windows to enable the code, which arbitrarily limited the number of, of TCP IP connections. Um, so you could only have 10 TCP connections, right? And now people, of course, were very happy when we found out about this because they realized they could just change one bit in their registry and they could get an $800 upgrade to their proprietary software. Um, um, uh, but, but this is a great example of this. Somebody in the Microsoft Office, their job was to build the feature, probably a small team of people, to build the feature which would limit, which would limit the software in this way. They then had a group of people, they had tests which would make sure that, in fact, the, the software couldn't use more connections. This was an engineering process to make the, so to make the software like, much worse than it would be otherwise. And the only reason they were doing it was to push people to buying the more expensive product if they wanted to use their software as a server, right? But that was in 1996, right? Things are different now. Um, uh, this is Windows 7. I need, to, I need to update this for Windows 8, which I realize uh, came out recently. Uh, um, you can choose today between a whole bunch, a list of different versions of Windows. Windows 8 has an even longer list, as it turns out. Um, most of them are distinguished from each other based on how much memory on, on the computer you want to use. So we can look at Windows 7 uh, Starter, which is limited to, Windows, the, the one up there is limited to two gigabytes of memory. Uh, the, it, the default wallpaper, you can't change the wallpaper paper in Windows uh, 7 Starter. Um, uh, you have to pay more if you'd like to do that. Or, um, and it can only use 250 gigabytes of disk space. Um, an initial feature which they developed but then eventually dropped was that it would limit you to three running applications with a user interface. Um, um, there was a team of people. I mean, think about it. If you're an, if you're an engineer, right? Like, like it's actually it's non-trivial to build this. To think of because uh, uh, you have to distinguish whether or not an application will ha be running a user interface. Um, you need to provide an interface. You need to be able to stop those applications before they run. You need to be able to prompt the user with with a message which says, "I'm sorry, you're running the maximum number of." Uh, versions of, uh, you're running the maximum number of uh, graphical applications, you need to try something else. Um, there was, there, there was a, it was a large project to make the software so bad, and the goal here, Windows Starter was almost given away, it was sold at a very, very cheap price, and the goal was to make the software so bad that anyone who could afford to pay m money to get, out, uh, to, to get out of there would do it, right? Um, uh, uh, this is what I mean by an ANSI feature. Now, um, uh, I mean, could you just imagine being on that team of people and like having to come home every day and say like, yes, today I, you know, made this version of Windows really bad in a way that, uh, um, um, now, now it's not impossible, uh, now, I mean, I am, this is, I'm talking about free software here, and it's not impossible um, for someone to write that kind of feature into free software. And some people have tried in various cases, but it can't last if the software is free, truly free, in terms of the four freedoms. Because free software gives users control in the way that I've talked about um, um, earlier over what their technology does. And anti-features are a way of designing software in ways that exploit users. This is absolutely exploitation. And when users have control, they're given a choice in the matter. And most users choose not to be exploited when given the option. And the result is quite like simply that anti-features can't exist in the, free, in, the, in, the, uh, in the free world in the long term. That, 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 that the resistance to anti-features is an inherent benefit of free software, truly inherent. The, but I want to go back to, um, uh, I want to go back a little bit to, to, to those, some of those graphs that I had earlier, the, all those power law distributions, because it's certainly possible that many people um, in those, in uh, many of those people who's with, in that first line with all the uh, single people contributing to projects didn't consider their projects failures, right? Um, and there have actually been studies where people have gone out and talked to large numbers of free software, um, uh, like people who'd created these projects on SourceForge. There was a nice, there's a book called, kind of hilariously, Internet Success. Um, uh, by Charlie Schweik um, uh, and Bob English, which was published by MIT Press, where they surveyed lots and lots of free software contributors, people that had uploaded projects to SourceForge for the most part, and asked them, did they view their projects as, uh, as failures? Um, and the answer is, most of the time, yes. Uh, most, people, most people did. The vast majority of pieces of s software on SourceForge are failures in the eyes of their creators. But 
Um, what was interesting was not that people felt that their software was, uh, was, was unsuccessful. It's that for the most part, people were basically okay with it. Um, uh, they were not particularly upset about the fact that their software never really got traction and, and got taken off because failure in SourceForge, and I want to argue more broadly within free software, is cheap. Uh, um, uh, there isn't, uh, this isn't, when you're, when you're building free software, you're not building a startup, an organization, right? Nobody loses equity in their house, at least for the most part. Um, uh, nobody loses their parents or their friends' money. Um, it just took a few minutes, a few hours, maybe a few days. And mostly it was just for fun. Um, developers of a lot of these failed projects solved their own problem. They had fun and they learned something. And moreover, their ability to have lots and lots of failures for certain types of very complicated problems has a very nice quality. It means that, potem that more potential solutions can be tried and that there's a higher likelihood of finding the runaway success. So um, lots of people in the innovation literature, which is sort of where I've been, my academic training is, have, have f thought about searching for a solution to a problem, um, like or creating an innovation or sort of getting a hit product as sort of like wandering through a field trying to find the highest point, right? Except you can't see, right? Like so, um, or at least not very far. And if we've got only one person, the most likely solution is, if you're in a space like this, is that you're gonna walk until you find a little hill and you're gonna um, get to the top of that first hill, if you're lucky to hit a hill at all. Um, except, uh, of course, this is just sort of a, a sort of a two-dimensional model with one, one thing up here. Um, if we think about the way in which w real projects might succeed as sort of trying to find a little local maxima or a global maxima, we're talking about like, you know, hundreds of dimensions. So everyone, you know, visualize, uh, you know, a some space with a hundred dimensions. You got that, right? Um, so once you visualize it, you'll see that it's much more difficult. Free, uh, uh, free software projects, because they've been, they're motivated in part by freedom, can simply fail more easily. And that failure means that, fr that free software can search this space more widely because there's many more people sort of walking this space. Hundreds of thousands of failed projects in the, from the perspective of search in this space is actually a really good thing because it means that we're trying lots and lots of, uh, we're trying lots and lots of stuff and we're more likely to find those global maxima. Failure in this sense can be our friend. And indeed, for every famous piece of free software, we can find, a, or free culture, we can find a whole bunch of failures run by a bunch of people who, for the most part, don't feel that bad about their failures. Um, everyone knows Wikipedia. What you might not know about is that before Wikipedia, there were, uh, I found eight attempts to create um, online collaborative encyclopedias before Wikipedia. Um, uh, and I've, for some of my other work, interviewed all the creators about their alternatives. And what's interesting is that despite the fact that they basically created Wikipedia before Wikipedia and then had their project not take off, for the most part, they don't feel, they don't feel particularly bad about it. Some of them will say, yeah, I was a little bitter for a little while, but I got over it. Wikipedia's great. Um, because, um, um, and many of them, in fact, have be gone on to become major contributors to Wikipedia because, failure, because the failure was very cheap. And this type of cheap failure is an inherent benefit of a free model. The third thing I want to suggest is that free software makes success cheap. Um, and another way of looking at what I've already said, um, uh, said is that just as though it's easy to fail in free software, it can be very easy to succeed. The, the bar for success can be very low. To succeed in like a piece of commercial software, um, free or proprietary, but most are proprietary, um, uh, uh, one needs to make money. Most free software is not similarly constrained. In, in those surveys that I mentioned before, people describe success as releasing a couple times in a few months, um, being downloaded you know, a few times, having a little bit of a user community. You can't build a company on that, right? Because free software decouples the economic model from the practice of software development. The fact that you very often can't build a, um, a, a, a company on it is okay. Many developer, um, developers are scratching their own ish. One of the smarter things that I think that Eric Raymond has pointed out was that the reason that some people, uh, um, and from surveys there's lots of reasons to believe that this is a large number of people, contribute to free software projects is because they're solving their own problems. They're scratching their own itches. Now, uh, ESR meant this as some sort of self-serving economic activity, which seems not to be um, true so often. But in every survey of free software or free culture um, users that I've read, the number one re reason cited for contributions was that the users found it enjoyable um, and that they're learning from the process. Um, and that they're learning from the process. In that people are participating because they find the act of participation enjoyable, every project is a success. Um, and, um, and of course, this makes sense. Most of us are volunteers. If we weren't having fun, we'd be off playing Tux Racer or something else. But it's even better because what counts as an external success is also lower in our communities. 
Um, people here are familiar with Haiku or Aros. Um, Haiku is a free software re-implementation of uh, BOS, and Ar Eros, I guess, or Aros is a free software re-implementation of Amiga OS. Now, Haiku and Eros are not two commercially successful operating systems. Um, they are re-implementations of proprietary commercial systems that failed because their markets became too small. Uh, um, um, and, but there are a few people around who loved those systems and who cared for them and who really wanted to run their old games and uh, have their old OS on their computer, and they weren't a large market. And probably not even a large enough market to pay a few developers to maintain and write the code. But they were enough of an audience to, so to solve their own problems. And in that sense, although they were trying to re-implement known commercial failures, they are successes. Because in the free world, the cost of success is simply cheaper. But, uh, the, but the virtue uh, of the fact that anybody can modify it, um, uh, modify free software, that is to say the second freedom, and share their changes and collaborate with others, that is to say the fourth freedom, free software is actually, re is actually resistant to lock-in and dependence of a single individual in a way that proprietary software is not. And uh, I want to give credit where it's due because this is the one thing in the open source mission statement. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the open source initiatives mission statement that I actually th that I actually agree agree with, and that I agree is an actual inherent advantage. Um, this idea here that in a, an end to predatory vendor lock in, because this, unlike everything else in there, is about freedom, um, fundamentally, um, and in many ways it's closely related to the to, to the closely related to the reason why free software is resistant to anti-features. It's the one important mechanism through which, uh, through which resistance happens. That said, not all lock-in is predatory. Sometimes well-meaning people in free software communities also become bottlenecks. And the fact that we don't have to depend on any one of them, well-meaning or not, is, one, is a real inherent advantage that free software always has. Um, people uh, uh, who here has used Gnome Gill or heard of it? Does anyone here remember that? Uh, one person. Uh, people, Sodi Podi, anyone remember that? Uh, a few people. And Inkscape? Okay, like everyone, right? So, uh, uh, so for my money, Inkscape is one of the greatest pieces of free software out there right now. I absolutely love it. Um, and it has a good, and it's, it's as good, as my opinion, as the proprietary competitors across the board. But its road to greatness, Inkscape's road to greatness, has been complicated, to say the least. Um, Gnome Gill was started by um, uh, Raph Levine, uh, uh, and he's a brilliant developer, most famous for writing the original free version of GhostScript. And very, very early on, he did a bunch of work on a Gnome SVG re renderer, which was called Gnome Gill. It was the SVG renderer. Um, then, as smart and motivated people often do, he wandered on to other great projects. Uh, the, the code was then forked by another developer um, named Loris Kaplinsky, an Estonian developer who worked on the project under the name Sodipodi, sort of took that code, um, which means mishmas in Estonian. And apparently, uh, for a lot of reasons, people found it difficult to work on that project. Um, and in 2003, Inkscape was forked um, so, uh, uh, by a group of former Sodipodi developers. And the project continued side by side for a year or so until the weight sort of shifted more towards Inkscape. Now, Kaplinsky still isn't happy about the whole thing, apparently, um, but basically everybody else is, as far as I can tell, um, because, uh, uh, because Inkscape is, 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 is really great. But the point is, is that if the software had not been free, Sodipodi might never have happened without the good work of Levine being done, um, being done and being available to anyone who was you know, more motivated and more interested in bringing the project forward. And if the software hadn't been free at that point, Inkscape may never have happened. Um, uh, because they might not have been able to take the good work from Levine and Kaplinsky and move it into a project with more energy and direction. Um, and it doesn't always work out this well. Um, uh, in fact, it almost never works out as well as Inkscape did. But it always can, um, uh, it, which is a lot more than we can say about a lot of proprietary software, or even most great pieces of proprietary software, which when the, their maintainers uh, walk away are just left to rot, not because no one cares, but because no one can work on them. And the fact that, and, and, uh, and, uh, and that represents a real uh, advantage, a real inherent advantage of, of free software. Now, the, the sort of next, the, 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 the penultimate point that I want to make is that freedom can lead to fantastic cooperation. And I've already, and I've already emphasized the, um, uh, the, the can, but I also want to emphasize the does. 
And this is a great, uh, this is an image taken from an old uh, Libre Planet shirt, actually, from a few years ago, which sort of tries to highlight the free software world. And you can try to identify each of the little logos up there. Um, I've played that game before. Because, um, but I think that these are all great examples of what free software can do. And I think that there are reasons to believe in the, at least to some degree, in the, in the, to the paleo ramedis model. Because I believe, that, I believe that freedom can lead to cooperation, which can lead to better stuff. And not just better stuff, but like impossibly better stuff, as a lot of these examples um, will show. There's, there's an academic paper that's estimated that the cost of building the Debian project and all the software in it. And it estimates the cost, and uh, there's another paper I've read, which estimates the cost of building Wikipedia through a traditional you know, encyclopedia uh, develop, development methodology. And, these, and I find these questions just silly. So Debian would cost $21 billion to write, if we want to go out there and write it, right? Um, to, write all the, to write Debian and all the software in it. Um, no company on earth is going to spend $21 billion to build a full operating system and all of the software that you need, including software to run dentist office. There's, a, there, there's dental office running software in Debian, written by a Debian developer who's a dentist. Um, um, uh, uh, pizza parlors. Debian contains pizza, a couple different pizza parlor running software. Um, it's actually just too big. Um, um, what the free world has produced is too big to create in that way. It's too comp comprehensive. Um, it serves too many small markets. Um, anyone who's spent um, as much, uh, uh, but, but anyone who's spent as, as much time as I have in arguments on free software mailing lists or on Debian mailing lists uh, uh, will understand that my suggestion that Debian is not the, is not the it, Debian may, might be the least efficient operating system ever built. Um, um, on some level, right? This idea, this idea of sort of economic efficiency and how much it would cost to produce it is silly because these things are not particularly efficient in traditional economic terms. Um, or Wikipedia is, I, I sometimes joke that Wikipedia is the least efficient way of writing an encyclopedia everyone's, anyone has ever come up with. Um, you have to argue and argue and argue with idiots um, uh, about um, just a little, a, a little word here which should be completely uncontroversial. But, but, the, but the choice here about the, talking about efficiency or the cost of producing it is silly on one hand. Because, um, uh, because, because our choice is not between Debian um, or Wikipedia on the one hand in freedom or sort of Debian, this sort of Debian-like or uh, Wikipedia-like proprietary alternative because the proprietary method simply can't produce the things as big and as complicated and as nuanced um, as, the, as, as, as the, the kinds of things that the free world has created. We have an opportunity here to produce not, um, you just can't write an encyclopedia, you, you can't write an encyclopedia as big and comprehensive and as, as Wikipedia um, through the closed method. It just doesn't work. We don't know how to do it. We have an opportunity here not just to make stuff that's really great, but to make really great stuff that can't exist except in a free, free world. Sometimes free software succeeds. It succeeds enormously. It succeeds beyond what proprietary software can. And that, prov and, and, and that um, provides an inherent benefit. But the final thing that I want to suggest is that I think that, um, um, is that what free software gives uh, it, uh, fundamentally is, unsurprisingly, freedom. Um, and I think that we've done a huge disservice in some ways to the free software community by talking about software freedom instead of about user freedom. Because of course, software doesn't need freedom. Um, users need freedom. Um, and uh, this is, and, and uh, you know, I, I think that this is something which is, which is actually very, very broad. Instead, I like to talk about uh, free software in terms of autonomy, control, and empowerment. Um, I often tell a little story about mobile phones as a way of getting this across. So, uh, for, um, uh, uh, so if I want to send a message to you, this is, um, if I want to send a message to, to, not to you, but to someone who's not here, I want to send a message to my mother. Um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to, about this conference, I'm going to be limited by the nature of the tool that I pick up. If I want to write a text message, I'm going to be constrained to 160 characters. And because I use StatusNet, or what's the other one, uh, Twitter, uh, I may be very good, uh, I may be very good at writing at short messages. If I want to send a picture, and if my mother has the ability to receive a picture, I'm going to be able to communicate a very different message. If I want to, uh, I can sing a song, if I can have a voice connection. The point here is, is that the, 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 the affordances of my, my technology are going to, going to limit, in many cases, the nature of what I can say, right? They're going to determine, really, uh, really fundamentally, what I can say, who I can say it to, and sort of how I can say it, when I can say it. Um, um, and, the qu and, and the result of this is the question of who controls the technology um, um, becomes a, 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 an enormously, uh, enormously important political question. Because insofar as our experience of the world is mediated by technology, is not unlike 
our phones, the question of who controls that technology becomes the question of who controls our experience of the world. Now, um, free software is an answer, it's a long way of saying that free software is an answer to that question, of who gets to control the technology that we use to experience the world and each other. And the answer, and free software's answer is you, or rather users, users. Uh, a user should be able to control their technology and decide how it should work. And we can make this very concrete by going back to OpenMoco. Right? I've already suggested that OpenMoco had a lot of problems um, in ways that I've detailed mobile phones, um, but in ways that I've already sort of suggested in terms of that little anecdote. Phones give power and authority um, to technology companies, to phone companies, and to the government in many cases in ways and to degrees that 20 years ago um, w would have been unimaginable. It was the sort of exclusive domain of dystopian science fiction. Right. Um, your mobile phone has a microphone, a camera, well, maybe not yours, mine. <laughs> My mobile phone has a microphone, a camera, a whole series of sensors. It is constantly connected to the phone company's computer. It's, it's trusted with my most intimate personal information, my deepest secrets, my most casual encounters. It runs, and, and, and for most people, it runs software that you cannot see and cannot change. Um, that software is written and can be changed without permission or even knowledge or even your knowledge by the phone company or by the manufacturer of the phone or by other people. Um, it is controlled completely and totally by organizations that, that we do not trust at all and that we know, we actually know, are secretly giving our data over to governments and to other people's governments. OpenMogo didn't do many things, but some of the things it didn't do were pretty great. Um, um, even if most people don't think about it, freedom is worth something. Um, it's, something, it's worth something profound even to most people that don't think about freedom. And that is where I think our advocacy should begin. So I can return to those examples of successful projects. Because I don't see those graphs that I showed earlier as a sign that we're doing anything wrong. I think that sometimes we're doing things very right. I, th I don't think that a dozen encyclopedia projects um, before someone got it right is necessarily a problem. Or that haiku or eros uh, moving along is a sign of something we're doing wrong. The only unforgivable failure I see is that our communities are not systematically learning from our failures. Uh, we're not comparing our successes to our failures to learn why it, is some of the, um, so why it is that some of our projects work out super well, while most of them do not. We're too busy talking about how great our stuff is to notice that we had to fail 10 or even 100,000 times to, to get there. So despite the fact that, uh, um, despite the fact that you've heard from others who carry the free software um, banner, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think that I believe that the question of whether free software is better in purely practical terms is irrelevant. I actually think it's very important. And there's a great, uh, a great paper that I read by an um, Italian economist named Fabio Landini who argued that, that uh, who actually looks uh, and says, okay, free software development can in some cases be really well. But, but um, what his, his suggestion is is that, that, that in order to build in order to find out that free software can work as a proprietary, like, like, and can be sort of equally competitive to proprietary software, what, needs, what needed to happen was there needed to, there needed to be a bunch of people who were willing to use it and work on it and advocate it and make it better even when it wasn't. He, he calls it a cultural subsidy. And he suggests that in, and, and so, I mean, he's, a, he's an economist. He's not a free software advocate. He says, I don't know. I just, I have this model. It suggests that free software can work, but only if there's a small number of people who are motivated by something enough that they're willing to work on it even when it isn't better, that they're willing to find out how it can work even when it isn't. Um, and he, and, 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 and he, calls and he points to the, to the free software movement, our movement, groups of principled individuals willing to work towards and improve things even when they're not um, better as the cultural subsidy. Um, um, and I think that it's a great, it's a great opportunity, it's a, it's a reason for us to be, to, 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 to be excited about moving forward. Um, because, because, because it's an answer of what we can do when free software isn't better. We can fix it. We can make that software better. We can, find out, uh, we, can, we, we can find out how it can be improved and we can work on it. And we can advocate for freedom in terms which, uh, in terms which are more honest both to our principles and to the sort of empirical reality uh, of the communities that we work in. So that's what I've prepared. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And there's, I believe, a little bit of time for questions and answers. So. Oh, sure.